and people, people can can join us in a few minutes. Um, so, most important thing first: if you have any questions, uh, ask them right away. So you might know seminars where you understand the first four slides, and then you get the feeling that the uh, speaker is mainly trying to impress you with their math skills. And this is not such a seminar, so <laughs> I'm trying to keep everything um, very understandable. And if I fail in that, then please, you know, ask a question right, right, um, right then. Uh, you can interrupt me anytime, and you can also write things in the chat, which I will not see, but Danny will keep an eye on the chat and uh, stop me. Okay, so as you might know, the topic today is Monte Carlo methods. And um, a few words up front. So we will do two sessions around 90 minutes each, and Daniel suggested a, a quick coffee break, you know, between after 45 minutes uh, from now. And uh, you will get the lecture slides, which I'm annotating here, and you will get um, the videos of which we record now and things like that. Um, right, so I'm, I'm not an expert in Monte Carlo methods. I just know a few things and um, I'm, I'm okay with that. <laughs> so there might be questions we have that I cannot answer, but then I will do some research and get back to you by our next meeting. So um, this will be a, a complete crash course. I'm assuming not much. And I'm, so my, my, my goal is that you understand every word I say and every slide I present to you. So that's what you uh, should aim for. And um, I hope I, I will do a good enough job for that. Uh, so you'll learn how Monte Carlo methods work, so what they are and what they do, how you could apply them. And uh, this should facilitate you to pick up another book or read uh, a more advanced paper on that topic. That's the goal after the second session. Um, in, if, if I were to explain that in one minute, Monte Carlo methods are just one, one method that does two things. Either it is uh, an integration rule, a numerical integration rule for integrals of that form, where mu is a measure and f is some function which is Let's say nice enough so we can work with that. And the second um, property is that you can generate samples from a measure mu. So samples, very broadly speaking, is something, if that is your measure, so that's the density of a measure, then samples would be you know, random points generated from that sample such that in the long run, if you make a histogram, this histogram converges to this density. So those are samples. Those, those points here on that axis are samples from measure mu. So Monte Carlo methods do those two things. And um, the, they are strongly um, connected to each other. Historically, Monte Carlo methods were developed by uh, physicists doing statistical mechanics. But in, in the meantime, people have applied Monte Carlo methods in, in statistics and in other applied systems. And um, I, I gave you a presentation to look through, which was about Bayesian inverse problems. And I think I'll, um, oh, I didn't write that much. I'll skip, skim through it quickly. So we are on the same page. Okay, so Bayesian inverse problems is my favorite approach to Monte Carlo methods. And the idea is that we have some unknown parameter x. This could be an unknown number, or it could be an unknown function, or an unknown image, or you know, anything at all, really. And this unknown parameter data distributed according to some density rho x. So this is this um, can be something probabilistic, but it's also something which could just model your belief about that parameter. So it could be, you don't have to think about that purely probabilistically. So if the density rho x looks like that, you're essentially just saying, I'm quite sure the parameter is, you know, somewhere here, could also be here, but it's, it's not down here and it's not you know, back here. So that's, that's just what a prior is saying. A prior is modeling your belief and it can be interpreted as a probabilistic 
object, like a measure. And you know, <clears throat> sometimes I will say x is distributed according to a density, and sometimes I will use a measure for that. But, but those two things are you know interchangeable. And the Bayesian inverse problem setting is this. So we we want to obtain x, but we don't get x directly. We have some measurement of x, which is given by some of x via this mapping f, and then some maybe additive noise epsilon here. And Bayes' law tells us how we can update this prior measure on x via the data to something which hopefully gives us more information, which is you know, a lot narrower. So we can say, well, the parameter is probably somewhere here and not, not here. OK, um, that was some, some, some math. So you can write down explicitly what the distribution of x given the data is. And that was this formula, which we will see again later. So this uh, is Bayes' law. This is the prior. This is the likelihood. And it makes sense that if you want to combine your prior knowledge about this parameter x with the data that you obtain indirectly, this, this y, then you have to combine those two things. And Bayes' law says that you have to multiply the densities, the prior density, and the likelihood function. And then in order to make this normalized, because it has to be a measure, so you have to integrate it, and it has to be 1, you just divide by you know, the integral of the numerator. And then this will be a proper density for a probability measure. And there is uh, another way of looking at that, which is, we can divide by the prior, and then we get this quantity, which is the rod and Nikodim derivative. So this is, um, um, well, let's just say this is d mu y divided by dx of x. Yeah? And this prior is actually d mu 0 dx of x. So my pen is annoying me a bit. Now, if we divide this term by the prior, you can see that we obtain d mu y divided by d mu zero. So this is either just a formal calculation, if you want, but it's also something mathematical, which is the rod and Nikodim derivative. So it's the density of the posterior with respect to the prior. This has you know, this form. So I know this is a bit, um, this might be a bit unfamiliar to you. So it looks very technical, but this means that we can, um, we have a representation for the posterior um, in, in, in the language of the prior, so to speak, it's by just a constant times the likelihood. Okay, so I, so I hope this, this wasn't too, uh, too quick because I um, sent you this video in advance, so. Okay, and um, well, the maximum likelihood estimator is not so important in that context, so we'll skip this in the repetition. But the so-called MAP estimator, the maximum a posteriori estimator, is the parameter x such that our posterior density is maximized. So this is the best parameter in the sense that it maximizes the posterior density. So I have um, yeah. we'll probably better look at this example here. So we assume that we're in this setting. And we're looking for x. x is somewhere along this axis. And this blue line, this blue density, is our prior belief about this parameter. So what we say is, basically, this parameter x is somewhere between, let's say, minus 4 pi and 4 pi. It can be a bit further out, but because of those exponentially declining tails, we basically say outside of maybe 8 or 10 pi, it's, it's basically impossible to uh, have this parameter here. It's not a hard constraint in the sense of, constraint and optimization theory, but it's, it's, you know, it's a bit more subtle. It allows us to go further out if the data is good enough. Um, OK, so this is our belief about x. And then we have some belief about the measurement noise. This is also distribution. This is a, a much narrower distribution, also a normal distribution. And our data y is given by sine of x plus epsilon. What we can see right, right, um, right now is that 
this data 1.1 is outside of the range of this forward operator. So we cannot invert the forward operator in order to obtain X. And you know, this, the second problem is that this is not one to one, it's not injective. So we can't do any classical or naive inversion with that. But Bayes' law gives us an answer nonetheless. We just have to plot the likelihood function, which is you know, just plugging in the formula from the last slide, gives you that orange curve. This orange curve well, does something which makes sense. So if the data is 1.1, that means that X is probably very close to pi half or you know, two pi periodic copies of that. So this likelihood peaks at pi half and three, so two pi plus pi halves, five pi halves and so on. And multiplying those two and um, figuring out that constant is not that important for the shape of the function gives us this posterior, which says that, you know, it, it combines those two things quite nicely. It says it's still under this envelope of plausible parameters and those peaks are the best you know, options that we have. Okay, so that's, that's the, the, um, the mathematically rigorous way of combining your prior belief with the data that we obtained. And this is our answer to that. So this distribution, so this is, this is the, the posterior is rho of x given y is equal, equal to y. That is our answer, but sometimes we want to get something more concrete than just a measure because a measure is, especially in high dimensions, it's hard to, to work with. So there might be a few things that we want to do. So either we can, we want to sample from this posterior Sampling from this procedure would you know, give us points here and here and next to that and here and here. So those are representative points for this, for this measure. Or we could look at the map. Now you can you know, visually see what the map is. It's the point of highest posterior density. We could look at the mean here and we can also compute um, intervals such that the parameter is with high probability in that interval. So those intervals could, for example, be no, this interval, this interval, this interval, this, and this, and you know, maybe those again, those two. And those uh, seven intervals together probably make at least 80 or 90% of the posterior mass. So um, if you want to do something with I know, industrial applications, it might be good to have a small interval such that with high probability, this is the optimal uh, parameter. Okay. Um, and in, in one sentence, Bayes' law is you have some prior belief about something, an image or a function or some, some object and you use data and map this to the posterior. So I hope this is either repetition for those of you who have watched the videos or um, for those who didn't, this uh, hopefully motivated how we sometimes get measures and we want to do something with those measures, which is a bit more concrete than just looking at this measure and saying, well, we're done now. Okay, so I have to save this, these slides and if there are any questions you can um, ask them now. Otherwise I will continue with the next slide. Okay, so either I already failed miserably and you're all logged out or, <laughs> okay. So Monte Carlo integration. So now we'll actually start with Monte Carlo. So let's say we're in the setting from, from before in a Bayesian inverse problem where we have a, a prior on some parameter which is unknown to us, but it's not completely unknown because we have some prior belief and this is mu zero. So mu zero is our prior measure and it has density rho x. I, I hope the, the notation is all right. It's a bit, a bit technical sometimes. Um, and then we get likelihood. We have a posterior, which is this, which you might recognize from a few slides before. So this is in the form where we express the posterior in terms of ordinary Lebesgue measure. Or in this form where we express the posterior in terms of the prior. Okay. And this uh, constant C is the normalization constant, which is 
just the, the integral of this function here. Good. So sometimes we look at the posterior as having a Lebesgue density. And sometimes we think about this posterior as being as having a density with respect to the prior. So those are the two ways of looking at the posterior. And sometimes this is easier and sometimes this is easier. It depends on the context. And especially in infinite dimensions, this is the only thing that we can do. Because in infinite dimensions, there is no such thing as the back measure. And then we need to be able to express the posterior in terms of the prior. So again, no, stop, stop me any time. Um, okay. So now we add another dimension in order to make things more interesting. So this is our posterior. So those are level sets of the posterior. So you have to think of that as being you know, in three dimensions, um, a landscape with mountains. And then this is the density of this measure. And this is already quite complicated, although it's only in two dimensions. So there are those two components uh, with a peak here and another peak here. This is a slightly higher peak. And there's this X-shaped structure. And the mean is in this um, saddle point, maybe, somewhere here. So as you can see, this is a complicated answer. If, if um, someone asks me, so what is our distribution of the parameter given the data, and I just give you this measure, then you're probably um, a bit unsatisfied because well, this doesn't answer a lot. So sometimes point estimators are better. So if I say you say this is the mean, then this is a nice answer. Or if I say, well, this is the map estimator, and this is a nice answer. And if I give you some samples as well, then you might start to get satisfied with my answer, right? Because now you can look at um, typical points, which are those black dots. So extracting information from a measure is a task which is worthwhile. And those are the first four tasks that I could think of. The first thing is computing the, the map estimator, which is an optimization problem. And this is the only of those, those things that is not done by Monte Carlo integration. So I've grayed this out. You can do that. That's an interesting thing. But sometimes the map estimator is uncharacteristic of a distribution and not um, a really um, typical event. So for example, if you take a measure like this, it has a high peak, and then it has a very broad distribution like that, then most samples will be somewhere here. But the map estimator is here. So if you just look at the map estimator here, you're losing a lot of information, which is why sampling is a good idea to do. So this, this is um, point four. Generating samples from a distribution gives you a better picture of what the distribution is like, because you can look at typical events from this measure. Uh, the conditional mean is the mean of the posterior, which is you know, the, the average. Um, it's best explained visually. You integrate the variable with respect to the measure. This gives you, in this example here, this small red dot here. And you can also compute conditional variances. So this is a formula for, for 1D, of course. In high dimensions, you have um, matrix products here. But the conditional variance in, in, this, in this case would probably give you something. What is a good color for that? Maybe this. Probably give you something like an ellipse shaped like that. So it, it gives you some information, which is the data is more or less slightly diagonally oriented with more variance in this diagonal and less in this diagonal. Um, in high dimensional settings, looking at the conditional variance might show you that there are directions um, which are very flat and which you can drop similarly to, let's say, principal component analysis or something like that. So those are interesting quantities, the mean, the variance, and you know, samples in general, because you can look at typical events. OK, is that uh, clear so far? Are there any questions?
And now, because we are dropping this Bayesian inverse problem setting, um, we'll just write mu instead of mu y. And this just says we're interested in computing integrals of this form. So if f of x is x, you know, then this is the mean. And if we set x minus the mean and square this, then this gives us a variance and there are you know, more complicated functions that you might want to look at. So integrating those integrals uh, over this posterior measure is something interesting and gives you insight about insight in the form of the posterior. Okay. Now, why, so how does that work? So uh, we'll see that sampling and integration are strongly connected. So what I will explain next is if you can sample, so if we can generate samples that I, IID means in well, identically and independently distributed samples. So if we can sample independent samples from the posterior, then we can approximate all such integrals. But why is that? One, one of the best examples is the mean. If we want to compute the mean of some quantity, which is you know, either the expectation of the random variable with respect to the measure we're looking at, or in this form, integral over x d mu of x, and this is approximated by taking n samples and computing the empirical average. That is something that is intuitively correct. So if we, um, let's say our distribution looks like that, those are the level sets, and we take samples like that, and we take the empirical average, the mean of all those dots, then we get something around here, which is close to the analytical mean of this distribution. Um, so that is intuitively correct, but we want to look at this a bit more mathematical. And one version which is proven easily is this form. So I hope this probability theory is not um, driving you away. So this is the empirical average. Empirical average. What it says is in the long run, so if we take lots of samples n, then the deviation between the empirical average and the analytical mean m um, will be higher than any, any small number that we can pick and this, this probability will go to zero. So that I didn't explain this well. So if you pick any number epsilon, which you could, could uh, set any number that you want, and you want to look at the probability that your empirical average is epsilon away from the true mean, then you just have to take enough samples such that this is almost impossible. So in the, what this says is this so-called weak law of large numbers. Uh, in the long run, this estimator, this empirical average will converge to the analytical average. So this is just a weak law. There's also a strong law, which is much harder to prove. So we will not do this. Um, we'll just look at the weak law because it's, it's for intuition sufficient enough. And we will be able to prove this in five minutes or so. So the first component for that is Chebyshev's inequality, which you might have seen in a probability class, which says that if you have some distribution like that, uh, mean is somewhere here maybe. Um, and then you look at the probability that your random variable is at least epsilon away from the mean. So this is the probability of this, um, this area here. This um, is less than the standard deviation, which is something like that here, divided by epsilon squared. So we can control the mass of extreme events of any given random variable. And this is not hard to prove. Um, in fact, it's, we'll do this right now. So uh, we can look at 
we start with sigma squared. Sigma squared is by definition given by x minus m squared d mu of x. You know, from minus infinity to infinity. I don't know why my pen keeps you know, messing up my scribbles. And now we can decompose this integral in two terms. The first term is the set of all x such that x minus m, oh, it's, get, it's getting annoying, x minus m is less than epsilon with the same integrand. Also, so x minus m squared d mu of x plus you know the same integral where this is larger than epsilon, same integrand here. Now we can look at those terms um, you know, separately and we just drop the first term. Well, this is certainly bigger than zero because we're integrating something positive plus, well, on this set of x such that x minus m is larger or equal than epsilon, this integrand is you know, larger or equal than epsilon squared. And we integrate this over the set of points that x minus m is greater or equal than epsilon, d mu. And that is the same thing as, well, this is just a number, epsilon squared, times the probability that x minus m is greater or equal than epsilon. Now we can just divide by epsilon squared and then we get this, this formula here. It's a very easy lemma to prove, and it will come in very, very handy when we want to prove this weak law of large numbers, which is, is um, similarly easy. We start by defining the empirical average, one over n is that k. So this is this quantity that we want to look at, and now we compute its mean and its variance. And the mean is, well, the expectation is something we can uh, put inside this sum here. So this is equal to the sum of the expectation of those zk. And those zk are IID samples from this random variable z with mean m. So each of those samples has mean m. So this is m, and then we take a sum with n terms of the same number divided by, by n, so this is again just m. And the variance of Wn, um, right, there's this, this um, property that you can pull out numbers from the variance squared, so we get a one over n squared. And then we have times n times the variance of those zk. This gives us sigma squared divided by n. Now we can use Chebyshev's inequality. So we, this is our Wn. This is exactly the setting of, of, of Chebyshev's inequality. So this means that the probability up here, this is less or equal the variance of this Wn, which is sigma squared divided by n divided by epsilon squared, which, as you can see, converges for n to infinity to zero. And that, that proves the weak law of large numbers, which says that you can indeed compute the mean of a random variable by sampling from it and computing this quantity, this so-called empirical average. And that um, motivates how Monte Carlo methods work. We can compute an integral, and m is an integral, because remember, m is the integral over x d mu of x. And we can approximate this integral by sampling from the random variable and you know, computing that quantity here. OK. So the weak law of large numbers says that in the long run, this integral is approximated by this quantity, which we can compute from samples. And this works in the same way 
if we don't look at the mean, but we look at an integral of the form f of x d mu of x, because if we sample those zk from x, then those f of zk are samples from f of x, which makes sense. So that means that this integral is the expectation of f applied to this random variable x. And by the weak law of Roche numbers, this is approximated by this, right? So if we get samples from x, we can compute all derived quantities, which, are, which we can write in the form of an integral with those samples by just plugging those samples in some function and then taking the average. And this converges in the sense of the weak law of Roche numbers and also in the sense of the strong law, which we haven't talked about, which is a bit stronger form. Okay, so that is all you have to take away from, from this. We can compute uh, those integrals by sampling from a measure. Okay. A few examples before we... I, I have a question, Philip. Yes, please. Uh, this f, does it has to fulfill some regularity properties or whatever, so, or nothing? Um, I don't think so. So not, so this, the speed of convergence can be really low. So if your f is, um, if your f is, so let's say your f looks like that, and your, oh, this is f, and your mu looks like that, then you know things will get really complicated because um, your, your function lives on the domain of the state space where your measure puts almost no mass. So you might have numerical problems, but there is no need for f to be differentiable or even, or injective, it can be any, any function really, because transforming f, sorry, to transforming x via this, this mapping f gives you a new measure, and this is always a measure because, you know, this is just a push forward measure. You can do whatever you want with a measure and you, know, you will get a different measure out of it. So I don't think that you have a lot of assumptions on f, it just might be that the convergence is really bad. I mean, at least you plot it always continuous. So this I you think it should be, yes. Um, I, I plot it continuous mainly because if you have, well, you know, I don't need to do, pr do this continuously. So F could be really any function. It can jump, jump, jump jumps are no problem. Um, plateaus are a bit interesting because if you, well, what's the best way to, to think about that? Let's say you have a normal distribution, this is x, and you map it via a mapping f, where f is, um, is x for x positive and zero, <coughs> sorry, zero for x negative. That means that everything to the left of that line is mapped to the same point, to zero. So we'll, you will get a Dirac measure and you will get additionally this half of the Gaussian distribution. So you, you might get something which is really complicated. So this doesn't have a density with respect to the Beck measure, but it's still a proper measure. So you, you can think about this in a measure theoretic way it just might be that, you know, things don't work out as nicely in practice. But it doesn't have to be continuous or uh, differentiable or anything else, I think. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Okay, the most important example we already look, looked at. An interesting integral is the, the conditional mean. So what you can do is we can sample from the posterior and just compute the empirical average. And that gives us an approximation of, of this, this integral. That's the 
easiest example that we can think of. And another example is slightly different. This normalization constant C that we had, which was the integral of the prior times the likelihood over the whole state space. Sometimes we need this normalization constant explicitly numerically um, in, in some applications, for example, if you would want to do model selection. And then what we could do, we could write this in this form. So this is the form with respect to the prior. So um, we can sample from the prior, so not from the posterior this time, but from the prior. And then we can evaluate this function, this integrant function in all those samples. And we could, in principle, compute the evidence. This is called the evidence, this constant C. We could compute this C in this way. Um, there, are, you know, there, there are practical problems with this approach, but in principle, we can compute this integral via that. Okay, so that is uh, why we need samples in, uh, in order to compute integrals. I'll just save this, this uh, slides again. And next topic would be how we can sample from distributions, unless there are any other questions. Okay. And before we talk about difficult measures from which we want to sample, we can talk about the easy case, which is where we can directly sample from. So given a measure mu, how can we obtain samples from it? So th this will be difficult for difficult measures, but there are some measures for which it is very easy. And those easy measures are uniform or normal measures. And why is that? So uniform measures on zero one, it, it sounds a bit too easy. Um, so why should we be able to sample from a uniform distribution? But this is something that, we have to do this somehow. We can't just pick always the number one half because that's not that's not random. So what is done in practice is we pick a so-called ergodic mapping. For example, this one, but you know, this is not a good practical mapping, but it works. So we use this mapping. We always multiply by two and uh, remove the number. So remove, um, for example, 0 0.7 is mapped to 1.4. We drop the one. So this is map to 0 0.4. So this, this mapping is ergodic, and we jump through the sp state space between 0 and 1, and this generates us uh, pseudo-random numbers. So this is how uh, sampling from a uniform distribution is done in practice. So not with this mapping, because this um, removes all floating, floating point numbers in a very small amount of steps, but they're more sophisticated ones. So uniform sampling is easy, and Gaussian sampling is also easy. It's something called the Bucks-Muller uh, transformation, where you have to sample from a uniform distribution. Then there's some easy transformation. Well, you know why this is correct. Um, it's not important right now, but you can sample from a Gaussian from in this way. So this uh, you start with uniform samples between zero and one. So this is maybe u one, and you obtain Gaussian samples Z1, for example. And then you can take them and scale them out in order to obtain more complicated Gaussian random numbers, which have which don't have mean zero and don't have variance one. So that, that is easy. Um, uniform measures and normal measures, Gaussian measures, are easy to sample from. Uh, the next uh, step is from some measures which are neither uniform nor normal, we can still sample directly which is, so just, you know, just believe me because it's not important for the rest, I will basically rush through that. So if we have a distribution and we can compute the inverse of the cumulative distribution function, if that's possible, if there's a closed form solution for that quantity here, then we can sample from a uniform distribution, map those samples via this, um, this mapping, and then we get samples from the measure. So why that is possible, you, you could um, you can read the slides and then work through that. But basically what it says is, so we have a density like that. This is neither uniform nor normal, but the cumulative distribution function is 
easy to write down, which is just the square root of y. And then we can get uniform samples between 0 and 1, plug them in this function here. And what we get is, is that. So each of those bars has you know, um, about 3,000 samples in them. They all spread out like that. So they all kind of fanned out like that. Maybe not as extreme as I'm drawing them, but you know, they are mapped via this mapping. So in some cases, the sampling is easy. Uh, uniform sampling is easy. Gaussian sampling is easy. And for some analytically easy measures, we can you know, do this transformation. And it's also possible to do this um, very efficiently. But for all other measures, we are we have basically lost without any further ideas. Um, again, you know, saving this, these slides. And we can finally start with the first idea of proper sampling that I'm going to follow um, Daniel's advice. And yes, make, let's have a break. <laughs> a quick five minute coffee break for everyone who wants to get a coffee or wants to stick around and ask some questions. Okay, so we'll resume in five minutes. Okay, the next step is important sampling because it's probably the easiest way of sampling for a non-trivial measure outside of the easy cases, uniform, Gaussian, or we could do this integration, this uh, inverse trick. And um, this is the first of you know, a series of approximate methods we're going to look at, so Monte Carlo method. Um, the, the first thing about important sampling is that it does not generate samples, which is a bit um, sad. So it's, it's, I don't know why it's called important sampling, because it does not generate samples, but you can still compute integrals of that form. So, Excuse um, me, I cannot yes. see now the, the, I just see Philip. Uh, is this oh. my No, problem? you should see my screen. I need to re-share my screen in this case. Okay. Is that better? Yeah, thank you. Okay, sorry, I stopped um, the screen share. So, okay, um, I didn't do anything important in particular. No. Okay, so important sampling computes those integrals which we're interested in, like the mean or the variance or you know, other things like that. And we need something else. So we have some measure of interest, which is mu. And additionally, we need a measure nu. So I hope this, this difference doesn't get lost uh, in my language, I will also call this measure new the reference measure. Um, and what does this reference measure do? It it has to be so mu has to be absolutely continuous with respect to this reference measure, which means if this let's say outer measure new if this um, assigns zero probability to some set, then mu has also to assign zero probability to that set. So we can, um, we can draw this, or well, let's say this is mu, looks something like that. So let's say it's, it's actually zero here, if you do that. Then this reference measure mu has to look something like, so it can do whatever here, just, it's not important what it does here. Um, but then it has to go up, and then maybe something like that. So what is not allowed is that the density of this measure new, this reference measure, um, is zero somewhere where the measure mu is not zero. So that is not allowed. The, this reference measure has to be you know, kind of a dominating measure for mu. So if mu has positive measure somewhere, then mu, the reference measure, all also has to have positive measure there. The second thing is we have to be able to evaluate the, um, the rather Nicodem derivative of mu with respect to nu. And this is, in this case, if we have densities the same as the ratio of the densities, the so measure the density of mu and the density of nu. And the second requirement is that this reference measure mu has to be a measure where we can sample officially from. So it either has to be a uniform measure or a Gaussian measure or um, um, a measure you know, we found some way of sample efficiently from. 
And we will use this, this reference measure in order to compute this integral via the measure of interest. The, the formula is quite easy. This integral of interest, integral over f uh, with respect to the measure mu, is, um, or by definition of r of x, same as integrating f times r with respect to the reference measure, because you can just you know, um, kill those two terms, and then you end up with d mu of x. And because we can sample from mu efficiently, this is approximated. You know, this is then just one function that we can look at. So we can sample from new, from the reference measure, and use the machinery from the last slides to uh, approximate this integral, just by uh, yeah, putting those samples in the integrand here and computing the empirical average. So that's um, a really easy idea. And you can see how this does not generate samples for mu. So we, we just have samples from new and we kind of re-weight them um, with, um, with this R of xi. Um, there are three settings in which this makes sense. First setting is where our reference measure is Lebesgue measure, or well, not properly Lebesgue measure, let's say a uniform measure on some bounded space because you know the Lebesgue measure is not a probability distribution. And in this case, the first condition means that mu just has to have a density. So if, you know, this is, this is why measures are also called absolutely continuous. This just means absolutely continuous with respect to the back measure. So that means it has a density <coughs> dx. And this density we have to be able to evaluate, but that's something that we have assumed before as well. So this is not a big uh, restriction. And we need to be able to sample easily from the Lebesgue measure, let's say on this cube here or on the uh, unit interval. Uh, we know how to do this because we talked about that uh, a few slides ago, where we um, talked about sampling from the uniform measure. Or here it's maybe even easier to just use a grid, um, a, rec a regular grid on zero one by one over n, two over n, three over n, and so on. And if we do that, use that grid here, then integrating this function f of x via d mu of x is you know, the same as this, the sum here. This is approximated by this sum here, f of xi times r of xi times one over n. And you may recognize this as just a Riemann integral approximation of this integral, of this Lebesgue integral. And um, you can see why this, this should work. Now, in high dimensions, you will get huge problems because the size of your samples on the this box grows like n to the power of small n, and and this does not work anymore. But it's it's nevertheless a good sanity check for important sampling. If your reference measure nu is the vec measure, then important sampling basically reduces to Riemann integral approximations. And if you do not take a regular grid, but you actually sample from a uniform distribution on, on an interval, then well, you don't get a regular grid, but you get something, uh, maybe something clustered here, then uh, this integral reduces to an irregular trapezoid uh, quadrature. I don't know. So you could look at this from a purely numerical analysis perspective. The second example is where you look at, again, the Bayesian inverse problem. And um, we, let's recall that the posterior is given by some constant times the likelihood times the prior. And we will just assume that we have this constant C, although this is not that easy. And we are interested in integrals of this form. We want to integrate some function f of x over the posterior. Then we can, um, sorry, where's the slide? Right here. So we have this, this, um, this form of writing this in terms of the prior. 
So I will write this down quickly. This integral here is the same as integrating f of x times c times rho epsilon of y minus g of x d mu zero. So this is the prior. And that means if we are able to sample efficiently from the prior, which we often can do because the prior is the prior is often something easy like a Gaussian distribution, then we can sample from the prior and plug those samples in you know, this this integrand function here, f of x times c times the likelihood, and then this is what we can up with come up with. So that is something we can in principle do. And the third example is, and this is the most important example because this, this is how Excuse important me, it is. Yes, please. Uh, why did you say there are programs with that? Um, it's always about high dimensions. So in, oh, in really, okay. Okay, okay. yeah. Um, or, well, but maybe this is not completely correct what I said. So the problem is, let's say the prior is a very broad prior. A broad prior means that we start with not a very strong belief about reality. So we say we don't know much about our parameters. And then um, we end up with a posterior, of course. So this posterior might so if our data is very informative, this means that our parameter range, which is realistic, is, is very narrow. So if the data is very informative, sorry, this, uh, no, no, ah, what am I doing here? So if the data is informative, this means that our posterior is very highly concentrated around some, some parameter here. And then we are wasting a lot of points. Yes, exactly. So if we sample from the prior, then we get those points here. Maybe we don't even hit this region where the function is interesting. And then we um, weight this by this likelihood, which is always very close to zero, which means that this is a very bad approximation. So in the long run, you know, the weak law of large numbers tells us that we will get enough samples also in here and then everything will work out. But initially, this will be a very bad approximation because the prior is so often um, a lot broader than the posterior and then practically this doesn't work that well. But it's, you know, the, 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 idea, the idea will be important. Okay. And that is, you know, that nicely motivates uh, the next example. If we, if let's say um, our posterior is something like, like that, so it is, um, it, is, it is concentrated in this region. And if our prior is very broad, so it looks like, like that, then we saw that it's not smart to use the prior as our reference measure. But we can assume that we have some, some idea about our, our posterior and we can guess where it lies, then we could use a different reference measure, maybe also a, a Gaussian measure, which is more concentrated around the posterior like that. And if we use the green curve as our reference measure, instead of you know, the prior, then this will work a lot better because we don't sample from this region where all the weights for our measures, uh, for all samples will be almost close, almost, almost zero, but we are closer to the region where our function is interesting. So important sampling tends to work well if we have some way of guessing um, where our function f is concentrated and where our measure, sorry, where our posterior is concentrated. So both, both things are important. Um, and one, one way to do this is the Laplace approximation. So what you can do is you can look at the map estimator and fit a quadratic function to the log of that. And then you will get something like that. So in this case, this will not work that well because, uh, well, it will still work, but you know, you, you can try to find an approximation to the posterior in terms of either one Gaussian or you know, a collection of Gaussians. Then you can efficiently sample from this approximation to your posterior. And then you can use important sampling to make this 
um, to, 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 comp to compute this integral. So that, that is how important sampling should be used. Don't just use any reference measure, which could in principle work, but try to guess how your posterior looks like and then fit something um, close to it. Okay. Now, I, I told you that you cannot sample from, you cannot construct samples from important sampling, but you can almost do this. So you can weight those samples by this function r of xi. So let's go back what r of xi was. Um, r of x is here. It is the posterior with respect to the, the prior, or no, not, not posterior and prior. So the, the measure of interest with respect to the reference measure. This is our, um, the, the ratio of densities. And if we use this function and um, associate this weight with those samples, then those, those yi samples will be weighted samples from you. So usually samples are just you know, marks on, on some line. And this, this tells you that probably there's a lot of mass here. So you could guess that your measure looks something like that, right? Now you can also look at weighted samples. And this associates um, a mass to those samples or a weight. So let's say we have one point here with that amount of mass. And then there are a few small, smaller blobs here. And then there's a really large blob here and a smaller one here. Then your guess about this, this measure would probably look something like, well, there, maybe there's some mass here and some mass here and a lot of mass here. You know? So you can you have more flexibility if you allow weighted samples also. And you can generate proper samples from weighted samples by resampling. So you, you split up those, those samples into, let's say, I don't know, maybe 10 normal samples. You know, those are maybe two each. Those are maybe, I don't know, five, five samples. Then you get a cloud of non-weighted uh, proper samples. Okay, so for example, if you have weighted samples of the form one half of x1, two times x2, and 1.5 times x3, then you would resample. You had one sample x1, uh, four samples x2, and three samples x3. And then that way you have generated your know, samples in the usual sense from weighted samples. In, in data simulation, this is done a lot. Uh, if you do ensemble Kalman filters or particle filters, then this is something which is called resampling. Okay. Oh, my son wanted to join me and my wife <laughs> removed him. Okay. Um, so this is important sampling. Are there any questions regarding important sampling? If not, I will save those slides. And we'll get to the last sampling idea for today, which is rejection sampling. And <clears throat> this is still um, in this in this regime here. So it's an approximate Monte Carlo sampling. I get a quick teaser for next next time. We will look at Markov chain Monte Carlo methods, which are kind of the gold standard uh, currently. But we will need some ideas from rejection sampling, which we will talk about now. And rejection sampling is able to directly generate samples without this resampling step that we had for important sampling. And it, it has a slightly, it has a familiar setup. We also need a refer reference measure. We call this new again. We also have to be able to evaluate this density R of X, and we have to be able to sample efficiently from this reference measure. In Addition, we have one more requirement, which is that this function r of x has to be bounded from above by some by some non well some finite number m. So, what would violate this is if, for example, 
Um, let's say mu is a Gaussian. No, no, mu is uh, something like e to the minus absolute value of x. So it would have a kink here, but that's not important. So it has, you know, not quadratically declining tails. And our reference measure nu is um, has a lot faster declining tails, like e to the minus x squared. You know, then the this is nu, and the other one is mu. So there is a density. There is this. This is a function which makes sense of, as a function, but it's not bounded from above by some number because the um, d mu divided by d nu is exponentially in x, so this is not bounded. So that's not important, and uh, this is not this is not admissible. But in most cases, it's it's possible to find a measure of this form, but it can be a bit tricky to fulfill this additional criterion. And rejection sampling works like this. As with important sampling, we first sample from the reference measure, and then we either accept or we reject the sample. We accept the sample with a probability, which is r of x divided by m. As you can see from this requirement, r of x divided by m is always between 0 and 1. So it's, it's positive because a density can never be negative, and it's bounded by 1 because r of x is bounded by, by m. So we, for this sample x, we compute r of x divided by m, then this may be one third. And then we um, need another randomizer, which uh, will uh, give us with probability one third, um, sorry, with probability one third, we will accept the sample and with two thirds probability, we will reject the sample, get a different sample x from new and you know, we repeat this. Um, this process, or in as an algorithm. Excuse me. Excuse yes, me. Please. This this m could be say arbitrarily large. I mean. Yes. This, yes. And, but it uh, in the limit it gives you the same, so it gives you a really sample. Yes. Yeah. That's the beautiful thing. Um, I will look at this algorithm first, and then I will try to motivate why this works. So uh, we need to be able to sample from new. We have to be able to evaluate this density R of X and we have to, oh, this should be M, not R. Um, we need to have uh, this number M such that R of X is bounded from above by this number M. And now we, in order to get one sample, we do the following thing as long as it's needed. We generate a sample according to this measure new. Then we generate a sample from a uniform distribution between zero and one. Then we evaluate this number r of x divided by m. And if u is less or equal than alpha, then we accept this sample. So why does that doesn't make sense? So if alpha is, in this case, 2 thirds, let's say it's 2 thirds, and then we generate a sample u, then this will, well, with 2 thirds probability, fall in here. So if it's less or equal than alpha, we accept this sample here. And you know, if, it's, if it's not, then you know, we have to try a new sample, try again, try again, try again, try again. Well, this could, in principle, this, this could take a long time um, just to generate one sample. This is you know, a drawback from rejection sampling. So what, why should this work at all, right? So the first time I saw this, I thought, well, um, it's too easy to, to work. Mm, the first thing that I want to show you is something which you could call geometric sampling, although I don't think that this is an actual term that you find somewhere, but I don't have any better idea for that. So let's say for simplicity, we are in a bounded domain and the measure from which we want to sample looks something like, I don't know, not important, maybe like that. So this is our um, d mu divided by dx. And we want to sample from this measure. So we, we just cut off somewhere and say we are just in this, this domain. This, this does work on the infinite domain, but it's harder to, to draw. And what you can do is you can make a physical setup 
you can um, draw this density on a, you know, on a board, you know, on a piece of wood, and then you, you just put it on the wall, you, you hang it on the wall in your attic or your basement, and then you, you throw dart arrows on this, on this board, you know? and then you, you hit the board somewhere. So if you're able to uniformly throw darts on, on the board, then you can do this. So you, you, know, you get um, your darts land somewhere on this board, and then you look at all darts which land below the graph of the density, And then you only look at the x coordinate here. So all those projections onto the x coordinate. And then this will get you samples from this measure. So intuitively, why does this work? So this is this is you can prove that this works, but intuitively, the reason is if your density is large in, in some region, then you accept more samples. And if your density is small, then you accept less samples. And if you do this, um, you can, for example, calculate pi. You may know this experiment. So you draw a square somewhere. Yeah. And you, you draw also a circle inside this, this uh, here. And then you throw darts on this board. And the fraction of darts which are in the circle versus all darts is then you know, the fraction of areas, of course, which is pi divided by 4. And this is the same reason why this works. So you can do this geometric sampling here. Um, the only problem is what happens if, and this is usually the case, if your measure is strongly concentrated. So it's very close to zero most of the time. And it has some component where it's interesting, then it drops to zero again. If you do this rejection sampling, you throw darts you know, randomly on the board, then you, it will take a long time until you finally hit and you accept one sample. This is what a rejection sampling without any modification does. So if you do this, then it will take, uh, in this case, probably 30 or 40 darts until you get one sample. And rejection sampling does one thing. Um, you cut away parts of the board, let's say something like that, and you call this d nu divided by x. So this is the density of the reference measure. Now this is multiplied by a function such that this density is always above the black density. So this, this black line is again the mu divided by dx. So if you're able to throw darts uniformly below the blue line, and this is basically the requirement, um, you can sample efficiently from nu. So if you can sample efficiently from nu, this corresponds to being able to throw darts below the blue line, then the ratio of darts which land below this black line increases strongly. So if you throw dots only in here, then you get a lot more samples um, that you accept. And why does it make sense, again, to accept only if darts are below this black line? So why does it still work in this slightly modified setting? So um, accept if the Y component of the sample is less or equal than d mu divided by dx, right? So that's what I'm proposing. Throw dots on this, this blue part of the, of the board and accept if the y component is less or equal than this density evaluated in the x component. And what is y? So y is, well, it's, it's constrained to this blue region. So it's a uniform measure between zero and d nu divided by dx times m, or we could say y is equal to a number u times d nu divided by dx times m, where u 
is uniformly distributed according to the zero one distribution. So this means that we accept if and only if u is less than d mu divided by d nu times m, which is exactly r of x divided by m. And that is exactly rejection sampling. So we sample from u. This gives us you know, those, those points here in this, this kind of box. And um, we accept those which are below the, the graph of the black density. And this is the same idea that this geometric sampling thing does. But because we use this reference measure, we are able to adapt it to the form of our the density from which we want to sample from. Um, so this is not a proof, of course, but um, it's, it's more important to get the idea. And then you can um, read the proof somewhere else, or I can give you some material to read up on. But that is a really nice idea of rejection sampling, that you're able to start with some sample new, which is easy to sample from. And then you can either attach weights to them. So that, that was the, the important sampling approach. Or you can do something which is called an accept reject step. And with either of those two, two methods, you can adapt your samples to be samples from something else, in this case, from a lot more complicated measure, mu. And um, we can, as a, as a quick teaser, what the next meeting will be about. Uh, no, this is the wrong one. Well, are there any questions? I will, I will look for the, the, the file in the meantime. I would have a question. Mm -hmm. so in, in typical applications, what do you have access to? To the density of mu or to the radonucleotide derivative? Because since you need this for sampling, uh, you have to compute it somehow, right? Um, usually in applications that I know, you have access to the rod and density of the posterior with respect to the prior. So in a Bayesian inverse setting, you usually know the likelihood. And the likelihood is basically this density. So the posterior with respect to the prior has density, which is the likelihood times a constant. And that you usually have, because the likelihood is how the data is generated from arbitrary parameters. And that is your, that's, that's your model that you have to have. So this, this little constant C that might still be a problem and important sampling and rejection sampling need this constant, but um, Markov chain Monte Carlo methods for next week will not need this constant. So you usually have this rod and density. Okay, but, but I mean, you said some minutes ago that typically you don't want to sample from the prior because it's too broad or something like that. Yes. Then exactly. it might not be helpful to, help, to, to have this density. <laughs> Um, yes, it is helpful. Um, in, next week, we'll see how. So um, you, we will combine the prior and the likelihood, and we will be able to, um, we will not sample from the prior, but we will use the prior. Okay. For those Markov chain model column methods. But, but you're completely right. So in, in most applications, and especially in high dimensions, the posterior is, um, it's concentrated so strongly with respect to the prior that you do not want to sample from the prior ever. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Okay, and a few remarks. Um, so if you are familiar with numerical integration, then you might think, why do we have to do this? So um, maybe I get back to could you please share your, your yes, screen? Yes, yes, I'm, I'm just looking for the right presentation to share. Whether this is a good one. Yeah, why not? So I'll, I'll share this once again. I have to figure out how, so, okay. Um, that should work, right? Okay, so if you have that kind of integral, then you might think, why don't I just use uh, trapezoidal quadrature or you know something more complicated than that 
um, I could I could do with a grid, and I could compute this integral by just doing you know, standard numerical things. And in all the examples that we saw, so everything I draw in one dimension, in those examples you would always be better off if you did this numerically. So you use a grid, or you do you know, Simpson's method, or something like that. So in one D, you you would never do important sampling or rejection sampling, and only in higher dimensions. Important sampling and rejection sampling become better than um, using a grid and you know doing trapezes and things like that. But if you get in very high dimensions, then those two degenerate as well, and then you need Monte Carlo methods. Uh, sorry, Markov chain Monte Carlo methods to improve 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 performance. So we will need those ideas from important sampling and rejection sampling in order to motivate how Markov chain Monte Carlo methods work. But in practice, you would usually not use them in very high dimensions, as far as I know. Any more questions? Um, in that case, I will send out a doodle link or something like that, so we can figure out a good time for the next meeting so that anyone who's interested can attend the second part as well. I will um, upload the slides and the videos and some more material. And I'll be glad to see you again next time.